Thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate uh, the introduction. You nailed it on the second time. It is podiatric. Uh, it took me over a year of working there to get it right, so don't feel bad. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate your time uh, and you know, stopping in with us to, to listen to this topic. Uh, it, uh, we should probably go maybe a half hour, a little more. Uh, it won't be too, too long. I'll try my best to be quick and concise and not uh, go on and on. And plus, I know we all have to get back to our Pokemon Go games, so uh, I don't want to delay that for you. So uh, as Stephanie said, we're going to talk about uh, accreditation and how to prepare for that and, uh, and how to you know, satisfy those requirements, as the title says, um, and using the item, specifically using the item categorization uh, process in exam soft. This is really going to take a look at the back end process of curriculum mapping to uh, achieve you know, the, um, the goals for, um, for our accreditors. So uh, really quick, I'm going to go over the, just three objectives and we'll kind of set an overview for what we'll talk about today and then we'll jump in it. So really the three things I want to hit on today is uh, I want you know, folks coming to this session to be able to really understand, describe the uh, category mapping in, uh, in ExamSoft. I apologize in advance, you're going to hear me say the word category a lot. Uh, um, I've done one of these previous, previously. I think I set the record for saying category, so I'll try not to beat that record today. Uh, just a fair warning, I'll use category and mapping kind of interchangeably. It's the, the, the same process in exam stuff. But uh, we want to uh, be able to describe that and how to use it in curriculum mapping for uh, accreditation. Uh, I also want folks to be able to utilize that category map and be able to uh, align their assessments with the necessary, uh, to meet the necessary accreditation requirements. And then finally, and, and hopefully most importantly, uh, it would, it's a goal that you, know, you walk away being able to create this categorization process. Um, so just a, a, a brief overview of where, where things are going today. I will do a brief overview of the categories in exam software and the category system. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, if you are familiar with it, I apologize in advance. It will be very brief, though, I promise. Uh, we'll also talk about the roles of, of faculty staff and um, how, how we have um, created that structure here. And we'll also, I'll also go through our methodology, how we prepared for our accreditation, uh, specific with our exam items, uh, and, and, and that, uh, the role of exam items in accreditation. And then uh, I'll just close with you know, what we're doing moving forward and some tips and tricks that uh, I and we learned along the way for better or worse. So let's jump into it. And again, I will be brief at this part. So in ExamSoft, there we can create categories. And uh, as you can see here by the, the first point, categories can be, we can tag or map items how, however you wish in the category system. Uh, we actually can create the categories to say whatever we want. Uh, some examples that I have there, the subject matter, the specific subject matter. Uh, I work in a medical school, as Stephanie pointed out, so I can, I'll give some examples from that in a, a moment here. Uh, difficulty level, we typically use Bloom. Uh, the question author, instructional method implemented, so you can see how your you know, teaching methods are successful in class. Style of question, on and on, and that last point, uh, the learning objectives being assessed, which is uh, the main point that I'm going to talk about today as part of the, the mapping process. Uh, the, the note there, we can put uh, items in as many categories as possible. Uh, we have some items here, honestly, that are maybe only in one or two categories. We have others that are in 12 to 15. It's really uh, specific to you know that item, uh, the course that it's used in, how it's used, whether it's a, a quiz exam, a take home, a homework assignment, whatever it may be. And then uh, I'd say the, the yellow one, I'm trying to make a point there by highlighting it. Uh, stats can be acquired based on each category that, uh, to learn the, the desired information. So based on how we categorize it, and again, looking at those examples above, uh, if we use some of those measures, we can pull stats based on those, on those categories to learn exactly what, what we want to learn about. Uh, anything from how our curriculum's performing to how our teaching methods are performing to um, and this is all through you know, looking at our student outcomes in this, those different areas. Now again, specific for today, I'll talk about uh, how this uh, affects our curriculum and um, us identifying if we are appropriately teaching to our curriculum as we have it laid out 
and how we show that to uh, accreditors and in preparation for accreditation. I apologize for that. We won't restart now, I promise. Okay, so uh, categorize, categorizing questions is pretty easy. You can do it when you import questions. Uh, if you, for those of you, you know, new to exam stuff, you can batch import questions. Uh, but when you enter questions into the system manually, you can also do it then. It's a really simple process. I'm not going to go through each step of it uh, on how to do it. Just know that when you create the question, you can definitely throw it in a category or multiple categories uh, at that time. Uh, we retroactively categorize questions all the time. Uh, as I'll mention later in the tips and tricks, that's not always the easiest process, but it definitely is uh, a viable option and how we got through much of this process uh, in preparation for accreditation. Um, again, you can you can also take uh, do a statistical analysis of this of your categories retroactively. So, for example, we have exams from three or four years ago that we never took stats on, but we've retroactively categorized them, and then we can run those stats um, again, even though the test hasn't been you know has been completed for over a few years now. Uh, categories should be pre-made, uh, so we'll set that category structure up first. I'll kind of harp on that later, so I'll just kind of breeze by it now. And uh, one neat thing is that category. You, you can work it as a folder structure as well, just to kind of keep yourself um, well organized and keep your, uh, it's really great for oversight in your, your, your curriculum mapping that I have there at the bottom. Uh, and it's been a, a huge help for us in uh, that process um, in, in keeping us, not just keeping us organized, but keeping us on the same page uh, in our department and working in uh, medical education, uh, but also communicating that outside of our office. So. Moving right along, uh, I just want to touch on the roles and how, how we have it set up. Uh, I've, as Stephanie mentioned, I have done this at a couple institutions, so I've kind of seen what, what works well and what doesn't work. And it's still you know, something that's evolving for us, uh, but I feel like we have a pretty good system in place now. So in, at our schools, the primary categorization uh, in the system itself, in ExamSoft itself, is done by the instructional design staff, which is uh, the office that I work in. So we're the, the administrators on the account and the program, and we're the individuals that uh, do make most of the changes. And by that, I don't mean putting questions in. Uh, we don't do that too, too often. But we maintain the program. We're, we're the ones that uh, pull the uh, uh, stats after exams to see you know, if our students are achieving the outcomes that we set out them, for them to learn, if our teaching methods are successful. So that's just our group is the one that's most heavily involved in that. Uh, faculty and academic support staff definitely contribute as well. Uh, just as, as you know at, at your institution, you have some super users that are very tech savvy and are willing to jump in and get involved in the program. And there's others that are uh, want to be more hands off. We definitely have the full mix of that as well. And so you know, we just kind of play those uh, personalities and, and make it work for us. Uh, one huge recommendation I have that I learned here is definitely create this, this process first. Create this, this structure first. Um, and limit the number of individuals that will actually work in the process. Uh, this is definitely a situation where you can have too many cooks in the kitchen. Throughout this process, we have had times where categories will randomly kind of pop up and we don't know who created them. So uh, restricting the access to the folks that do need the access is, uh, is something that we've um, really found helpful and uh, has provided us success moving forward. As I have at the bottom there, it just helps with consistency and, and program organization. Um, you know, obviously, you want enough folks to work in there, but so they're not overwhelmed. But uh, too many, uh, we found, has created an issue. Uh, so, in the, the process, uh, content experts are needed for for one one step of the process that I'll talk about today. I'm going to talk about two distinctly different ways that we categorize and map to meet these goals. Uh, for one of it, we do need the faculty or the content experts involved because we will talk about matching the assessment items with the intended uh, learning objectives. Uh, I'm not a content expert. If I were asked to do this, it would be horrific. So uh, we definitely need a content expert with that. Uh, again, as I have there, we can map it to more than one learning objective as well. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a one-to-one -one assessment item to learning objectives. And uh, throughout this whole entire process, and you'll hear me say this, over and over again about, about again about pulling the stats, um, but we can we can pull stats and, and we monitor them here to just really assure that our program is effective. Uh, if we can identify areas of improvement through uh, 
uh, you know, the, the statistics that we can pull with this, we definitely do that. So it's something that we always kind of keep an eye on and are aware of. Um, and we, we will do it formatively throughout the semester and then definitely summatively at, at the end. So just to kind of jump in uh, into our methodology uh, and talking about uh, our institution. We have a systems-based curriculum in medical education, so you know the different um, body or organ, organ systems. So we have uh, several content areas within one course. We don't, um, you know, it, back in, uh, in a, our older uh, curriculum, we would have you know a pharmacology or a physiology um, or you know a histology or pathology course. Uh, now we have all those blended together. Uh, into each of our courses. So with that, one help for preparing for accreditation is to categorize our items simply by discipline. And this is, it seems really, really a, a simple process. And to be honest, this, uh, this step of the process is the easiest part because we don't need um, the, uh, we typically don't need the content experts for this because having the, the schedule and knowing which faculty members teach which course, it's or which uh, content, it's really helpful uh, for us and, our, and, the, and the support staff to know how these need to be mapped. You know, we have specific pharmacology professors or spe uh, specific pathology professors. So if we're just looking at whole discipline content areas like pharm, phys, histo, those are all um, almost ready-made to map. So for the most part, we just do that here. And while that seems like it's a, a really simple process uh, for the, the a curriculum mapping process and for accreditation, it does indicate that we address the content, uh, if anything, by quantity in our curriculum appropriately. So uh, you know, when you go through the, the accreditation process, and one thing that we've learned throughout this is that you are expected to be able to map your whole curriculum from the very beginning, which is uh, the mission, and then all the way down to the very end. Uh, in, in this case, it's um, our assessment items. And so you really want to know how your assessment items support your learning objectives and how those su support your course goals and uh, how those you know, meet the, uh, the core competencies of your accrediting body and your program goals all the way up through to the mission. And so this last part uh, is, is really key in tying everything together and really you know, uh, closing the loop on the, the whole entire curriculum mapping. And this, this one part, although it seems really simple, has been a big help in just really identifying, yes, we have these different content areas, uh, and this is how we're addressing them, just kind of at a, at a macro level, look, looking to make sure that we do you know, meet all of the, uh, the requirements, like I said, just even in quantity of question um, in these broad content areas. So we also, as I have an, uh, a point here I kind of jumped over, we also look at questions based on um, some uh, teaching styles, our clinical uh, based case, our case based clinical lectures, uh, and our clinical problem solving group sessions. So, since those are, are those questions come from specific uh, uh, learning methods or, or instructional sessions, we identify those separately because students are expected to tie all of the you know the content information, all the farm and the path and the phys to then uh, make clinical decisions. So we do. Uh, bring those out separately from the other disciplines because we also want to show that we are teaching our students at a clinical level as well. Uh, so that, that's the, the mapping uh, for, for that portion. Here's just a screenshot I took and uh, <laughs> slightly blurry, I apologize for that. But this is just a very basic look at one of our mapping structures. So we have our curriculum mapping we have our, you know, our biochem and our case base and our clinical problem solving and, and all the content areas there. So we truly just you know, uh, categorize these items by these large content areas. Um, again, it really, really is helpful to, with the accreditation in mind to show that you know, we are reaching, um, we are teaching the, the content and assessing the content in a quantity that is uh, at the appropriate level. So, Moving on, uh, we also, um, the other section of our, our, con our categorization methodology is mapping items to the learning objectives that they address. So you know, we all know through whichever facet of education that you work in, we have to have learning objectives uh, for each class session. Uh, and so with, uh, but 
with that, we want to make sure that our faculty is appropriately uh, assessing their learning objectives. Again, to go back to the point of tying this all together, if they're appropriately assessing their learning objectives, then the indication there is that they're appropriately assessing their course goals. And if they're reaching those course goals, then they are you know, achieving the, the competencies of our, the accrediting body and, and you know, the, the program goals and essentially, again, the mission. So this whole process, again, really kind of ties, ties that all together. So there's, this really functions at two different levels. Um, as you can tell, I didn't really go through the thesaurus to name this really something special. So we have a small scale. And the small scale just indicates that we are assessing our learning objectives. I know that seems really simple, but obviously it needs to be something that we can uh, prove to our creditors that yes, we have objectives, yes, we assess them, and we have you know, outcomes to prove that students are doing well in those areas. Um, these math items, again, can come from quizzes, exams, or other assignments. We, have, uh, we do everything in our institution from take-homes with ExamSoft to in-class uh, open book quizzes to you know, in, uh, high, you know, high stakes exams. And, just about any other way you can think of using the program to, as a testament, we, we do use those. Um, so this helps because it shows student outcomes by learning objectives. And it really answers the question, are students appropriately meeting the learning objectives and therefore reaching our goals? And since we have this in a program, we can show that statistically. It isn't, oh, you know, let's wait for their board scores or let's look at our graduation rate. We can look at in our you know, first couple of didactic years in medical school, yes, we have these objectives. Yes, we can prove we're assessing them because we've tied our assessment items to those objectives. And yes, student outcomes um, are supporting that. The, the students are uh, learning and retaining that information because by each category, we can look back and say, you know, students scored at an 85% rate here or a 90%. Or, you know, the flip side, we can see, oh, you know, on these, this set of object objectives, students are only getting 65% of the questions right on those. So do we need to emphasize that more? Do we need to teach it differently? So there's other benefits that come from the, the curriculum mapping process that we found. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. Again, as you see at the bottom uh, with the asterisk, faculty is definitely required for this step. Uh, I've worked in medical school for uh, a few years now. I you know, tried my hand to see if I could uh, map these, you know, the, the assessments to the objectives. And I, there is I had no chance of doing that uh, effectively or appropriately. So it, it most certainly is um, a process where you know, you'll need the instructional design and faculty to, to be involved. So uh, the next you know, really official uh, way that I have named here is on the large scale. So as I kind of, I've kind of touched on this a bit already, um, and actually I wanted to emphasize it because it is, it, it is and has been so important uh, to our process, but this really completes the back end portion of the curriculum mapping for accreditation. And I, I can't stress that enough that it really ties together, you know, if you are achieving your objectives, goals, and so forth and so on. So uh, that, that middle note, I, I'll kind of skip over a little bit because I've already talked about it about three or four times now. But, uh, you know, we, we do want to prove that we are, you know, achieving um, what we set out with our curriculum. And that assessment items is really the final proof that we are. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I think I used this term before. It, it closes the, the loop on curricular mapping for accreditation. Uh, and without that, really, there's it's the, we found the most effective and uh, really, as far as time is concerned, for you know, faculty and staff, the easiest way to prove that yes, we are. Uh, achieving what we set out to achieve with our program, you know, with our mission and goals and everything, uh, is to say, look at how we're assessing them, look at how they're performing on those assessments. And that is, is was really uh, done throughout this categorization process, uh, which has uh, taken what was, when we first set out a really uh, daunting and uh, arduous task into something that we were able to streamline. And once we got pretty good at it, we were able to move through it um, in a pr pretty efficient manner um, that we are actually really looking forward to how this is going to set us up moving forward because, uh, you know, it, obviously when getting through accreditation, you, you really could immediately look forward to the next set of, uh, of accreditation meetings. So this is going to help set us in the, the right direction um, you know, 
seven years ahead. So here's just a screenshot. I apologize that it's not the, the largest uh, screenshot in the world. I tried to blow it up as much as I could by leaving, but while still keeping it on one page. But you can see there, just a really, really quick view. We have our lecture. Those are, uh, we have our, you know, our in, in this case, I just took a snapshot of the top four uh, learning objectives for, for this one session. I, to be honest, I'm not even sure if this was a one or two hour session or, or what, what have you. But you can see in the, there's the objectives there in the middle. And then at the far right, we have you know, the numbers. So the first one just had one question that, that um, was mapped to it. Was, you know, items three and four there, you can see each had three items that are mapped to it. So you can see in the short term, uh, you might not get the, the greatest stats when you look by just objectives because there are there is such a few a, a small sample size. But over the long term, if your objectives aren't you know evolving too too much from year to year, you can really get a, a larger uh, data set that allows you to take a, a bigger snapshot view of of uh, the effectiveness of these individual sessions um, and if, if students are you know, really achieving those objectives in the in the course. So um, we're actually already getting to the point where we're going to wind down just a little bit here. Uh, just from our point of view, moving forward, uh, our categorizing of assessment items is only going to grow. So this process that I, I showed today, the, we're complete with the uh, um, categorizing to the disciplines and different content areas. Uh, we've gone back and retroactively done a ton. As we have each new exam or quiz that comes through, we do that uh, as proactively as possible to get those into the system. So, uh, because we actually we use the feedback from those in, in different methods outside of uh, of accreditation. But so we that that part is is set up, and we're really comfortable with how we had that going, and um, have already been able to make some positive changes to uh, our instruction and um, just our, our overall curriculum because of that. But as far as preparing for, continuing to prepare for uh, accreditation and moving forward to the, the next cycle, uh, we want to continue to complete that to make sure we are meeting our learning objectives and therefore we can prove that we're meeting our goals and program objectives, et cetera. Um, and we'll have a, you know, an overall total snapshot of the curriculum with that. We're not there yet. Uh, this, this part of the task uh, of getting you know, the, the, the faculty involved and engaged into mapping to their objectives is a little bit more difficult of a task, uh, primarily because you know, if, you, if you are faculty or do work with faculty, you understand that uh, they're typically pulled in a lot of different directions. They have a busy workload or a busy schedule. Uh, and also, there's a lot more moving parts. You know, there's a handful of us in our department. There's a handful of uh, academic support individuals that assist with this as well, but we have you know, several uh, faculty members, um, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens, especially when in the, in the medical school setting where we have so many outside clinicians as well who uh, are don't, you know, giving their time in class uh, to help us. And so it's always difficult to touch base with them because they do have such a busy schedule. So this is, you know, it's a, it's a, I said it's a work in progress now and our goal, hopefully by the end of this, um, uh, this academic year, if not sooner, we'll have this complete. Um, one reason why we have continued this is throughout the accreditation process, we did get really positive feedback on this. And this is something that, um, helped, you know, for lack of a better term, it helped us throughout the process and it showed well for the school. And it showed that you know, we were um, doing well in mapping our curriculum to really you know, tie everything together. So. Uh, just to share some tips and tricks, uh, and this, these, some of them we learned, some of these we learned from doing things really well the first time. Most of them we learned because uh, we found out there is a better way to do it throughout the process. But uh, begin the process as early as possible. Um, I know that's really, 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 really easy to say, and I wish that I can say that we followed our, uh, this advice in the process. I know there's a lot of moving pieces, but the earlier you start this, the, uh, it's going to be so much easier to incorporate this and be prepared when accreditation uh, comes up. Um, most certainly establish the process for categorizing exam items uh, 
ahead of time. So I think it's really important, you can see in those next couple notes, not only should you have the categorization built in the system, and yes, as I have there with a the little asterisk, it can, the folder structure can be altered, the, the categorization mapping can be changed throughout the process. It's not, it, it's great that it can evolve and change, and it's been a huge help to us that it can do that, but it, it really makes for a moving target if you don't get it set up in advance. So before you even, you know, categorize or map that first item, I, to the best of your ability, I would have your complete categorization uh, model set up and have that communicated out to the folks that will be working within it, which brings me to the, the other point in there, is to really identify roles. Uh, that's something else that we didn't do as clearly as we, we should have the first time, and we didn't communicate as well as we should have the first time. Once we learned that that was kind of causing some hiccups, we kind of stepped back, identified roles, um, and I'm not just talking about in the system as far as you know, who you grant access to, which is important, but knowing you know, who's going to be the individual that is going to categorize it, uh, who's going to categorize using what methods or, or what measures, so really laying that all out. Um, you know, we've, we've noticed that our success, especially with our faculty, has really, really spiked once we uh, went back through and defined what our role is for them so they know what to expect from us, and then also uh, sharing our expectations with them as well. Uh, and once they knew their expectations, they have been terrific in, in getting involved and helping us categorize. Um, and it's been a, a huge, huge boost uh, in preparation uh, for, for accreditation. And like I said, it's something that we also got uh, terrific feedback on, on as well. Uh, you know, as cliche as it sounds, be proactive. Uh, one thing that's been a huge, huge help is when we have faculty members turn the questions in, we have them map them in that process. It's so much easier, we found, for our faculty members to, as they write their questions, to just write down the objective with it right then and there. Uh, we've actually kind of created a bit of a number system uh, that just works for us internally for mapping, so folks aren't having to write out their full objective with, uh, with the, the questions that they turn in. But, so that's been uh, really helpful and something I would recommend for your institution. But uh, again, ha having them create the question and a year later go back and flip back through their objectives that they use for that specific semester and then going back and reading all over all their questions just is kind of a pain for them and it just lengthens the process. Uh, so I, as I put there at the bottom, we didn't do this initially. We kind of learned that one the hard way. Uh, and obviously retroactively categorizing it, as mentioned, it's, it's, it's an option. It just makes it more difficult because it's, it's more time consuming you're kind of asking more of people than you really have to in the first place. Uh, another help with that actually is that it indicates to your faculty members that they should be cognizant of their learning objectives as they write their assessment items. So it really helps improve that, um, that communication with students. And it, as far as like, you know, these are my learning objectives and these, this is what I'm going to assess you on and then actually assessing them on that. So it's, uh, and not only does it set up a great structure in prepping for accreditation, but again, there's the little sidebar of it helps faculty in focusing on their question writing, and it, it helps students in knowing uh, what areas they need to prepare for, which I know is, as far as educationally makes sense and we should do that, but it's always nice to have that kind of as a, a structure in place uh, to help our faculty out. So we also had some unintended outcomes. I initially put consequences there. That's a negative word. So I switched it over to positive outcomes. Uh, it actually created an opportunity to improve and, and kind of streamline our learning objectives to improve communication with students. I kind of you know, hinted at that uh, as we closed that previous slide. But it allowed us to, to um, in some cases, actually reduce some learning objectives where we noticed that for you know, a 50 minute session, we may have had far too many learning objectives that we're asking students to meet and it was uh, getting confusing to students and it was kind of not allowing them to focus their their studying as well as they would um, as we would like them to and as as well as you know they need to uh, especially medical school with there being such you know it's, it's already a difficult uh, curriculum and subject matter and it's already a really vast curriculum so when we can help focus their studying um, 
in their work. It's not only helpful for, for faculty, but obviously it's, it's super helpful for students. So we found that, again, it, it streamlined our objectives in this process, which was great. Um, and one other is that it improved faculty knowledge uh, in the educational process. So in our area, we do faculty development sessions um, you know, a couple times a month. And this was an unintended great faculty development session for us. It allowed us to meet one-on-one -on -one with faculty members and go through the objective writing process and really focus in on that. It allowed us to go through the assessment writing process and focus in on that. And it helped give our faculty members, especially that the clinicians or you know, the folks that are just coming in every now and again, it helped provide them with a, an overview of our curriculum and uh, what, how we implement our curriculum. It really gave them an idea of where they contribute and how they're expect, expected to contribute. Whereas in the past for a visiting faculty member, it may have been, I'm gonna come in, talk for 50 minutes, drop some questions off and leave. This allowed them, again, to, to see a role and understand the importance of their learning objectives, understand the importance that the assessment items uh, play in the overall curriculum. And it's really through that, again, that whole, just the simple fact that we asked them to sit down and map these with us gave them that insight. Uh, and so it's been great for us with, uh, the, with the accreditation process because, you know, as I, as I mentioned again, and I, I've been saying it so much because it is uh, really the, the key point that I would like to get across is that when we do map these assessment items to our objectives, it sets up the rest of the curriculum and, and ties it all together to prove that we are doing what the accreditors expect us to do. We're doing what is best for our students and we're preparing them uh, for whether it's their next course, their next year, a board exam, their career, whatever our, you know, our mission is, uh, it proves that we are doing that all through the simple fact that we're assessing them appropriately and we're proving that by uh, categorizing these items to the, to the learning objectives uh, that we set out for students. So with that, um, I am finished uh, droning on and on. Uh, being a lifelong Clevelander, I would be excommunicated by my family and friends if I didn't throw this on the last slide. So if anyone's a Golden State fan, I greatly apologize. Um, just give us this one, we never get to win. So anyway, uh, Stephanie, if, if you have had any questions, uh, I'd love to open it up now. And again, I uh, appreciate everyone's time and, uh, and thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, yeah, we have a bunch of questions that have already come in. So folks, bear with me as I kind of walk through these because I think several of them are a little repetitious, but I'm gonna do my best to group them. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, now is the time if you do have questions for Dan regarding the presentation, if you'll type them into the GoToWebinar control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen under the questions area. Um, we will get to as many as we can in the remaining time that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and dive right in, Dan, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, great. So first question is, when you say you categorize by objectives, what level of objectives are you addressing? The broad AMA objectives, individual course objectives, or as precise as lecture objectives? Oh, that is a great question. Thank you. Uh, we do it by uh, lecture objective directly in the system. And uh, we we looked at uh, addressing it the you know again the by uh, our creditors objectives and again we looked at the, the course goals and objectives but we realized throughout this process it's kind of you know like a, a step process so we realized when we um, categorize them by the the session of, or lecture objective for that you know that class session uh, that. We then mapped our course objectives to our course goals, and then we mapped our course goals to our, you know, our competencies and to our program goals, and those then mapped up to our our mission. So it was really a one-step process uh, throughout to map each, you know, each level up to the next level that helped us uh, complete this. Uh, we realized if we went beyond the the session level goal and jumped up to the course goals, that we're we're kind of going out of order and got a little disjointed. But then going through you know, those little baby steps throughout that really uh, completed that big picture and tied everything together for us. Great, thank you. Um, next question is I'm just going to paraphrase a bunch of, a bunch of uh, attendees are, are wanting a little bit more information on your, uh, your numbering system. 
Uh, I, some people, I guess, saw the number 12 on your second screenshot and wondered if that was part of it, and could you explain that a little bit more, how yours is set up? Stephanie, you're referring to the slide on the screen right now. I am, yep. Thank you. Okay, so we, uh, for the sake of uh, the, the naming mechanisms in, in the system, we put the numbers in front of them just so they would stay in order, so they wouldn't default to uh, you know, uh, an alphabetical type method. So the reason that we have 12, you know, in this example, 12 lecture, you know, and then the name of it, uh, the previous lecture we named 11 lecture, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we started with 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, and went all the way through to, you know, however many we had. This just kept it in order uh, so that, um, in, in chronological order, excuse me, of the order in which the um, each lecture occurred within each course. So that's how we did. And again, you can see the the objective points below it. Those are, you know, again, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04. Those are just the objectives in the order in which they appeared either in the syllabus or in which they were given to us in our area. So uh, and with us, you know, I, I alluded to having a numbering system uh, in communicating with our faculty. If uh, the faculty member for this specific lecture uh, or his first question, let's say it uh, maps to the first objective there. Uh, he or she would simply, next to that question, write, you know, 12.1. And I would know it was the 12th lecture of the course and it was the first objective. So that was just the numbering scheme we made up so we could um, just to streamline the process and, and avoid always having to talk in terms of content, which obviously is over my head, but the, the numbering system really helped uh, in communication with that. I hope that was clear. If there's a follow-up question for that, uh, please let me know, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Okay, thanks. Next question is, do you have different committees for assessment and for curriculum, or are their functions combined for the same? Oh, we do. That's a, a great question. Thank you. Uh, we do have our, you know, the typical curriculum committees uh, throughout the, the different levels of, of our curriculum. We also do have uh, an assessment committee as well, and so uh, our assessment committee is specific to, to these tasks. And I'm just talking about, you know, in med school we have just the first two years are you know, classic didactic courses. So for these first two years, uh, we do look at how we categorize, and we use we actually use the stats that we learn from this categorization process uh, quite a bit in our assessment uh, committee meetings to make sure that we are assessing appropriately. Um, in, in all regards, are, are we assessing at the right, you know, the right quantity of questions? Are we making sure that you know, we learn through the simple fact that you know, how many times you ask questions on a specific topic that is um, placing a certain you know, level of importance uh, to students, and it increases their studying just by quantity. So, you know, looking at something as as simple as that, all the way to student outcomes, um, when you know on items from a, a given lecture to, in, in this case, are we asking, uh, are we meeting our learning objectives in, throughout the mapping process um, to, you know, for accreditation? Are we preparing our students appropriately like we say we are? Oh, that's, uh, that accreditation committee then will report back to our curriculum committee uh, as well so that uh, everyone is, is together and, and in, you know, in the know on that. Great, thank you. Next question is, do all your faculty categorize their own questions or only certain faculty, such as course coordinators? Oh, that, that's a terrific question. I think tell someone who's been through this. Um, so we, to the best of our ability, ask each individual faculty member to map their items at least to the objectives. Uh, we know that the, the question writer is the best person to ask in in that categorization process. Uh, as I mentioned, as you know, one of the kind of unintended outcomes that's been great, we've found that that's been really helpful in um, communicating to them that you know, they, they need to be aware of their learning objectives when they write assessment items. So that simple fact right there is something that uh, will keep us uh, along that path of continually asking individual faculty members to you know, give feedback on, and, and help us map uh, with that being said, you know, for those of you that work in medical education, there, you know, we do have outside uh, clinicians and, and faculty that come in to, to speak, 
and they're not always that easy to make get in contact with because they obviously are clinicians and have full-time jobs elsewhere. So in those cases, we will depend on the course coordinator. Uh, we understand that there's already a lot of responsibility that comes with being a course coordinator. So uh, we try not to you know, put all that on them initially, but at the end of the day, there are some courses where we fall back on them. Okay, thank you. Next question is, how are non-pedagogical objectives, example, experiential, behavioral, and professionalism objectives assessed? Can these be built in courses, and how applicable is ExamSoft for analyzing these kind of object objectives? Well, I guess working backwards from that, uh, it, the nice thing in using ExamSoft for this we found is that it's very customizable and you can we've, we've been able to make of it what we want to make of it so if, if we whatever category of information we want information on we can most certainly make that happen uh, in our curriculum specifically a lot of what I was just mentioned in, in that, that question happens more in the third and fourth year which we we do categorize questions when we use and by third and fourth year, excuse me, our clinical rotations. Uh, we do have clinical rotations that certainly use ExamSoft, and we uh, we will uh, map those items when applicable. We also, as um, many other medical institutions have now, um, have a course that's more about you know doctoring, um, you know developing a, a physician, and so that's where that comes into play a whole lot more. So if there is a form a formal assessment in there of you know, quiz or exam items, then we most certainly can map them. We have found more often than that that with those types of items, they're not always that formal type of assessment we're used to with a multiple choice type question. We tend they tend to be you know more experiential um, and more whether whether it's journaling or peer feedback or preceptor feedback. Uh, with that, if that's the case, if it's not within exam soft, we really can't use it for that function. But if it is a a written item that we can put into the system. We most certainly can capture that information and utilize it uh, for for the mapping process one, or uh, also to learn more about our, our students and our uh, institution, which is just you know one of those bonuses I, I mentioned earlier. That was a, a great question, by the way. Thank you. Okay, um, I've had several people uh, inquire about this. Uh, uh, we've got several people asking, just generally based off of what you're what you were talking about the the number system and how your structure is set up. Everybody wants to know approximately how many categories or objectives do you have because this type of setup seems like you you're just going you're going to have hundreds. So can you speak to the sheer volume of categories and how you manage all of those? Yes, that's a, a terrific question, and uh, unfortunately, oftentimes. Uh, I end up being the individual that, that takes care of that, so I can most certainly speak on that. Uh, so when we go through just simply looking at uh, the lecture or session objectives, uh, yeah, let's say we have you know four or five uh, lecture objectives per hour. That you know, obviously we can all do the math. That adds up pretty quick to have a lot of objectives, and that's why we do have you know more than one uh, person contributing to getting this information into the system because there are you know a fair amount of man hours that go into that you know it once you get used to the system uh, you can copy and paste those pretty simply off of a, a syllabus um, and get them in there pretty quickly uh, and I, I do know that from uh, personal experience and that's also that being said that that element for the curriculum mapping and preparing for accreditation has been huge for us, and it's been a huge help um, in communicating with faculty, with our creditors, and with our students. I mean, it's really, really improved the um, the communication part in our curriculum just through going through that exercise. So while I, I'm not going to lie, it most certainly was time consuming. It was a very valuable uh, process, and we learned several lessons throughout it. And it was again huge in our in preparing for accreditation. With that being said. You know that, that first part that I mentioned, where we did map by content alone, those were very broad uh, uh, categories that we have there. But while the one I have on the screen right now just has three or one in there, um, 
and, and you know, I, I probably could have chosen a better example for one that has more, but that's just the, the one that caught my eye. Um, but, you know, the, the areas where we have the broad information, the, the histology, the pharmacology, the pathology, those uh, categories have hundreds of questions in them. So that's, so we have, we really, we go about it both ways. We have a few categories with a whole bunch of questions in there. So we have a larger data set and we can, um, and that's to some degree for accreditation. And that most certainly looks at if we're assessing our students in the right quantity, but then that all, that helps us more as far as looking at teaching methods and looking at, uh, you know, um, just overall effectiveness of our courses. And then we have, we go the a complete 180 and we have a whole bunch of categories with few items in each. And really that's more where the mapping process comes in. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell by the questions that it does seem like an arduous task, but really once you get better at it, it's time consuming, but it's, it's actually, you know, it, after the first couple courses, we were able to streamline it and move through it actually pretty quickly. Um, and it became not so daunting. Okay, thank you. Next question is, how do you get the lecture from the faculty each year to add into the exam soft system, especially if the lectures are changing from year to year? Oh, that, that's a terrific question. I guess uh, that's a kind of a two-part answer. If we have folks that are, uh, folks by, by folks I mean uh, faculty members. So we have faculty members that are more proactive about using the system and more comfortable then they will enter their, their items themselves uh, or you know, edit the, the items themselves. We do have support staff though, and this is the, uh, the other part to it where they would then um, deliver their questions to the support staff and those individuals would put the questions into the system. Uh, I mentioned somewhere later in, the, in the, the talk that it was a big help to be proactive about the categorization. So meeting with the faculty members up front and saying this is what um, this is how we're going to categorize our items, showing them the the system. Um, you know they they don't need to to learn it for this task this task, but just letting them understand why we're doing it, just so the the communication is open and they can understand that there is a process uh, in place. And you know, obviously accreditation is a huge buzzword, so when we use that and we say it's for accreditation that's been a, a big help in getting everyone to participate. So we do expect new questions um, each semester. And when that happens, we do ask for them to be mapped to the, the objectives. And then we have support staff put that information into the system. And that, uh, that's really been, that last part has been the most frequent method and the one that we found most success with. Wonderful, thanks so much, Dan. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up there right now, you guys. Um, I, I, we've had such an incredible attendance today and just a plethora of amazing questions. I'm, I'm sorry to have to cut things off. Um, Dan, if you want to put your email address back up on the screen so everybody has it. Um, uh, so if you do have specific questions or would like to talk in greater length with Dan about this topic, there's his email address. Um, it will be you guys spamming him, not me, which is great. Uh, so if you have questions about his process, please direct them to Dan. If you have questions about ExamSoft's role in this, you can direct those to info at examsoft.com. Um, again, just a couple of housekeeping bullet points before we wrap things up. This session has been recorded. The recording will be available in the next couple of days. Everybody here will get a link to the recording. I will email that to you and to anybody who registered who wasn't able to attend. So once you get that, feel free to use it or share it as you would like. Um, also, as soon as you close out of the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, you'll get a pop-up for a quick survey. Again, we would truly appreciate your feedback. Please, uh, you know, keep five questions. If you would take a couple of seconds to fill that out, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, we have a couple more webinars coming up in the next few weeks. Find that at our resources page, resources.advanceoff.com. Uh, we hope everybody has a great rest of your week and afternoon. Thank you, Dan, for your presentation. This was fantastic. Hey, thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And as Stephanie said, feel free to, to message me if you kind of want to continue the conversation or if there's anything with which I can help. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you.